Well, good morning. Whoa. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Philip Moore, and for going on 18 years now, it's been my joy to serve here as executive pastor here at the Ark. It's always a privilege to stand here and to be able to share, and it's an honor to be with you guys this morning. As we get started, I want to ask you a question. Who here loves waiting? <laughs> right? I mean, nobody loves waiting. We, we don't even like waiting. We endure waiting, be it Christmas, the doctor's office, car rider line, or something simple as the traffic light that we're stopped at. Waiting tries our patience, and it can feel like a waste of time. It carries an, uh, with it sometimes we try and take things in our own hands when things don't go according to plan. And if you're like me, at times waiting can bring out the less than best version of ourselves, guilty. With all the stuff of life that's happening and going on around us, waiting is the last thing that we want to be doing. And we've certainly had some stuff in 2020. A global pandemic, quarantines, wildfires, floods, hurricanes, power outages, riots, financial and economical, economic upheaval, political and racial divides, and guys, we still have three more months to go. In the midst of all of this stuff, Perhaps you found yourself waiting. You're waiting for answers, provision, breakthrough, peace, healing, or strength. Some kind of relief from the constant barrage of stuff that is happening all around you. So I ask you this morning, how's that waiting going for you? Perhaps by now you thought you would have found some answers and there would be some kind of relief. Yet you find yourself still believing You're still waiting. Look at God's word in James chapter 1. It says, My friends, be glad even if you have a lot of trouble. You know that you learn to endure by having your faith tested. But you must learn to endure everything so that you'll be completely mature, not lacking in anything. My main point this morning is this. And if you get nothing else this morning, please get this. Waiting matters. We don't have to simply endure waiting. We can actually get stronger while we wait. Sometimes the process of waiting in our lives is sometimes just as formative as the answer itself. So pay attention to how you wait. The title of my talk this morning is Watch Your Wait. That's W-A-I-T. I did consider don't look overweight, but I thought that might be going a little bit too far this morning. Earlier this year, I found myself waiting. I was looking for answers. I was needing healing from the Lord in a way that I never have before. It was a difficult road, to say the least, and the stakes got extremely high. I didn't always do it perfectly, but I learned some things in the process of waiting that I wanted to share with you this morning. On July 1st, I woke up with not feeling well, and I took my temperature and found out that I was running a fever, and this persisted for a few days. On July 3rd, I visited the urgent care, and it was there that I tested positive for the virus COVID-19. They gave me a steroid shot, and they sent me home to let the virus run its course. I started feeling better that day, and I thought I was going to quickly overcome this thing like a lot of other people that I knew and quickly get stronger. But as soon as the steroids wore off, my fever returned, and my condition deteriorated, and I found myself waiting. For the next 10 days, I ran fever riding the roller coaster of waking up at different times, literally drenched in my own sweat, thinking that my fever had broken, only to have it return again and more waiting. During this time, I also developed, started developing difficulty in my breathing, and that seemed to be getting worse with every day. On July 10th, sensing that something wasn't right, Ellen took me back to the urgent care. And it was then that they diagnosed me with having developed COVID pneumonia. And based on my condition, the doctor, she wanted to send me directly to the hospital. 
Now, guys, I was avoiding that option with everything that I could. I didn't want to go and be away from Ellen and away from my family. And I had heard that the hospital wasn't really the place to be because it was only for the really serious cases. The doctor relented to my request, and after another steroid shot, she sent me home with two conditions. One, that I would buy a, a pulse oximeter, which measures the oxygen saturation in your blood. And if that number fell below 90, then I would go directly to the hospital. July 11th is a day that I will never forget. I started out feeling better that day, but as soon as that steroid shot wore off, my condition again rapidly faded and more waiting. All that day, my pulse ox numbers were dangerously low and, and very borderline. Still, I strongly resisted the idea of going to the hospital. Towards that evening, as Ellen and I were weighing out our options very heavily, we were trying to figure out whether we should bite the bullet and go or continue to write it out. I'll never forget the clarity that the Lord brought right in the middle of our conversation. Because despite our feelings and our emotions around the idea, we knew clearly right then that it was time to go. So we packed my bag and off we went. En route, Ellen asked me what hospital I wanted to go to. And again, I give the Lord credit for this because I hadn't even thought about it. But I was prompted in that moment for us to call my friend Linda. She's in administration at Memorial Hermann and for us to go there. Now, Linda, she's an incredibly kind, but she's a make-it-happen type person. And it quickly showed because we were greeted at the reception to the ER and immediately taken in. Now, guys, there was a definite transition into the isolated, closed-off world of that ER. Everyone there was fully hazmatted up with protective clothing head to toe, and they were extremely, extremely busy. But the nurse who greeted me and took me, she didn't miss a beat as she tucked my paperwork under her arm and she led me to bed 30. But talk about incredible care. That ER team immediately sprung into action and I was triaged in no time by two top-notch nurses. In a few minutes, the doctor came in. She was a very kind and attentive lady, but I tell you, she was no nonsense and she was highly direct. And it was in that moment and with the next words out of her mouth that the severity of my situation came crashing in. Seeing how I was struggling to breathe and, and to talk, not mincing her words, she looked at me and she said, I'm standing here trying to figure out whether to intubate you and put you on a ventilator or to put you on a proactive breathing device. Then she said the words to the effect, I don't want to see you crash. This all just went to a whole nother level in my world. Thankfully, she went with the breathing device option, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Finally, after stabilizing my condition around 2 a.m. the next morning, I was taken to a room in the critical care unit that was dedicated to COVID treatment. After the nurses, they got me settled in. The rush of the last several hours had subsided, and I was left alone. It was in that moment that I had one of the sweetest connections with the Lord. He reminded me of his, of his promise that he would never leave me or forsake me. He was always be faithful. I thought to myself, I'm in his hands. He's got me. And guys, I rolled over and I went to sleep. For the next several days, more waiting. I was awakened like clockwork to have my vital signs assessed to take a breathing treatment, ingest a list of steroids and other medications, and I began each morning with a shot in the stomach. I was not allowed out of my bed. With the 10 liters of oxygen being steadily supplied, my sole job was to breathe, and it was a job. Until you've walked that path, you never fully appreciate the, the value of one simple breath. Guys, I can tell you today, I now love breathing, and I highly recommend it to you. <laughs> I want to pause right here to give a huge shout out to our healthcare professionals. Talk about tough working conditions. Every, yeah, go ahead.
Talk about tough working conditions. Every nurse or doctor who entered my hospital room, they had to suit up head to toe with protective clothing, gloves, face shield, and, and a mask, sometimes two. While I was there in the hospital, I never saw more than the eyes of those who were treating me. When they left my room, they had to discard their gowns and their gloves and then re-enter with a whole new setup every single time for every single patient. Yet these professionals overcame all of those necessary barriers with incredible care, a compassion, and a personal touch. They called Ellen regularly and FaceTimed her in at times to bring her up to date on my status and on my treatment. Sadly, though, all throughout the night and day, on at least a half a dozen occasions, I would hear an alarm, a sound of an alarm go off, followed by these words, code blue, code blue. I found out later that that meant someone was going into cardiac arrest. Yet in spite of these challenges and these obstacles, these healthcare workers showed me what the front line of this pandemic looks like, and they met it with professionalism, bravery, and care. These are some of the people who took care of me. They put their lives on the line for me. They put their lives on the line for all of us. I know you did it before. Would you please join me again in showing appreciation to all of our healthcare workers? The nights in the hospital were especially challenging. Being alone, away from Ellen and my family, dealing with the sickest that I have ever been in my life. I'll tell you, a few times fear did try to sneak its way in. But I pushed back by recalling God's promises and leaning on his faithfulness. I would put on praise and worship music and I'd go to sleep. A few days later, after showing progress, I was downgraded to a regular room, but more waiting. Now I was down to five liters of oxygen. I still had the job of breathing, but now I was allowed to at least sit up in a chair and to begin to take short walks around my room. And yes, I was using a walker. I learned, though, that answers in our waiting sometimes start with tiny steps, literally. Over the next few days, my condition steadily improved with my oxygen level uh, down to, to three liters and the requirements there down to three liters and rooms needed for more critical care patients. I was blessed and released to go home. But I, was, I went home with an oxygen machine medications, and an order for home health. The nurses that day, they were very sweet to celebrate my discharge. And when they wheeled me down to the entrance of that hospital, I can tell you, besides our wedding day, I have never been more thankful to see my wife. For the next 14 days, more waiting. As Ellen and I were both quarantined to our house again, and I was on the short leash of an oxygen tube. Our friends and family, they stepped up and demonstrated incredible love during this time, dropping off meals, calling, texting, sending cards. I was deeply humbled and moved by all of it. For the next several weeks, I focused on rebuilding my strength. At first, I took laps inside my house, then I graduated to the end of the driveway, then a lap around the cul-de-sac, and then to the end of my street. I wasn't ready for any races, but I was thankful to be up and to be mobile. Then finally the day came. Three weeks after starting oxygen treatment in the hospital, I was able to come off of that oxygen machine and to breathe on my own. And guys, that was a celebrated day. My strength and my stamina continually improved over the next several weeks, and it was at the first part of this month here in September that I finally started feeling back and close to 100%. This sickness was humbling. It made me keenly aware of just how precious life is and how valuable the people are in our lives that we get to celebrate it with. But the thing that stands out to me the most the thing that brings tears to my eyes, just thinking about it, is how faithful God was during this whole ordeal. He was faithful to lead us to the hospital at just the right time. Had I gone later and waited, 
my path to my recovery would have no doubt been more complicated and more prolonged. He was faithful to answer the prayers of people that were interceding on my behalf. Ellen, our kids, Pastor Allen and Joy, our extended family and friends. He was faithful to keep my family from getting the virus. He was faithful to provide financially. Our health insurance company stepped up out of nowhere and covered all COVID-related treatment 100%. That meant that over $30,000 of costs were just wiped away. When I told that to Ellen, her words to me were, quote, no one can tell us that God isn't faithful. And he was faithful, guys. Sorry. He was faithful to preserve my life and to fully restore my health. But I can... But I can tell you, it didn't happen overnight. Two months of my life were consumed with wrestling COVID-19 and waiting. Sometimes God does the miraculous in an instant. Other times he does the miraculous over time. And no, I don't know why. But what I do know is this, how we navigate our lives while we're waiting is critical. We need to watch our weight. There's a great example in the Bible of a man who received a promise from the Lord. And for way more than two months, he too had to wait. He saw the Lord come through for him and he didn't handle it perfectly, but there are some things that we can learn from his life. That man's name is Abraham. We'll pick up his story in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, later he's going to be called, named Abraham, Leave your country, your family, and your relatives, and go to the land I will show you. I will bless you and make your descendants into a great nation. You will become famous and be a blessing to others. Look at this. Everyone on earth will be blessed because of you. Abram was 75 years old when he, the Lord told him to leave the city of Haran, and he obeyed and left with his wife, Sarai. She would later be named Sarah. Fast forward three chapters, Genesis chapter 15. Later, they're still waiting on the promises of God. The Lord spoke to Abram in a vision. Abram, don't be afraid. I will bless you and reward you greatly. But Abram answered, Lord, all powerful, you have given me everything that I could ask for except children. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said, look at the sky and see if you can count the stars. That's how many descendants you will have. Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord was pleased with him. More waiting. Genesis chapter 17. Abram was 99 years old when the Lord appeared to him again and said, I am God all-powerful. If you obey me and always do right, I will keep my solemn promise to you and give you more descendants than can be counted. After more waiting, Genesis 21, the Lord was good to Sarah and kept his promise. Although Abraham was very old, Sarah had a son exactly at the time God had said. Abraham named his son Isaac. Abraham was asked by God to leave his home and to settle in a new land, a land that he knew nothing about and where he knew no one. It made no sense at all humanly speaking. However, this obedience to God would come with a promise. And part of that promise was that he and his wife, Sarah, are going to have an heir. And it was through this heir that Abraham would become the father of many nations. Now, here's the deal. It's easy for us today to skim through nine chapters of the Bible, recapping their lives. But the fulfillment of that promise in their lives took 25 years. And I'm sure that it was very trying at times. And it came with some interesting twists and turns along the way. Here's a few things that we can note from Abraham and Sarah's story. While they were waiting, they didn't always respond perfectly. Abraham and Sarah are advanced in years. They're 75 and 65 years old when they get the news that they're going to have a child. And it was hard for them to believe. Scripture says that Sarah actually laughed at the idea. 
Now, guys, I'm only in my 50s. I think I would have a hard time, and I might laugh at that idea if someone told me that. When things didn't go according to their plans and their timing, they tried to take matters in their own hands. Abraham, he thought that his steward, Eleazar, would be his heir. Sarah thought that the answer would come through her servant, Hagar. Yet God had other plans. God had his plans. And in the end, Abraham and Sarah took God at his word. Ultimately, they trusted in God's character, who they knew him to be. And when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah 90, after 25 years of waiting, they received the gift of Isaac. Today, Abraham is known as the father of faith because his faith and his trust in God saw him through waiting. But what about us? How can we more effectively watch our wait? Sometimes we can underestimate the power of these stories in the Bible because in our minds, we, we attribute and we elevate these people to some superhuman status. We think that their stories are too far removed from our everyday lives. They're almost unreal or fairy tale like But these were real human beings needing real answers with real issues in the stuff of life. So what can we learn from them? And how can we apply it to our lives? While we're waiting, number one, we need to watch who and what has voice in our lives. When Abraham listened to the wrong advice rather than trusting what God had said to him, it only got him into trouble. While I was waiting, I got to practice. I got to practice guarding the input into my life. I was very limited on the TV that I watched, especially about news around the virus. And I fed on praise and worship music, first thing in the morning or late at night. And I selectively found encouragement from others. I was careful to surround myself with people who spoke life and hope and faith. And can I pause right here and say, guys, that's why coming to church is so important. These services, they feed our souls. But we surround ourselves also with people of faith, people who have been through some stuff in their life and seen God move on their behalf, people who are going to speak life and hope and faith, and people who are going to walk life with us. While waiting, number two, we need to hold on to his word. What kept Abraham on track was his going back to, his standing and trusting in God's word to him. I received two words from the Lord early on in my sickness that I went back to often while I was waiting. One of them was victory. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is a scripture that Pastor Allen actually shared with Ellen and I. It says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to take you back to the emergency room. When they put that proactive breathing device on me, that was a very polite way of putting it. That thing was extremely tight around my head, and it covered my mouth and my nose with a suction airtight type seal. It was highly proactive. And what you need to know about me is I'm extremely claustrophobic. This thing was like torture to me. Everything inside of me wanted to rip that device off of my head. But I remembered the word the Lord had spoken to me. And it was in that moment that the thought hit me. This is what victory looks like. I was able to keep that device on for what felt like an eternity and receive the, 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 the treatment that I needed. I learned that a word from the Lord brings peace, comfort, hope, and encouragement while we're waiting. Number three, while we're waiting, we need to remember that gratitude will carry our attitude. Abraham's first response when God made the promise of land to his descendants was to build an altar to the Lord as an act of sacrifice, of worship, and gratitude before it came to pass. Upon leaving the hospital, the doctor told me, that with a sickness of this magnitude, my body was going to take a while to heal. Later on, when I was reflecting on that diagnosis, 
I told the Lord this. I said, I'm going to stay thankful. I'm not going to get impatient. I'm not going to get discouraged. I'm not going to get depressed. I'm going to stay thankful for where I am in the process. Trust me, over the next several weeks, I had plenty of opportunity for that prayer to be tested. My body wasn't functioning at all like normal. I, was, I got tired very easily. Sometimes I was taking two and three nap, uh, naps a day. I got tired and winded very easily. My mind wasn't sharp. I was like walking around in a fog all the time. And recovery was hard and it was painfully slow. But while I waited, I was learning to practice gratitude. And I would say sometimes out loud, I am strong in the Lord. My body is strong, my mind is strong, my spirit is strong, and I am getting stronger every day. I am thankful. The reality was, compared to where I had been, I had tons to be thankful for. I just needed to remember and to practice this truth in my life. I learned that thankfulness is a great antidote to fear and doubt. And number four, while we're waiting, we need to trust who he is. Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the hall of faith in the Bible and has there listed both Abraham and Sarah. It says of them, they considered him faithful who had given the promise. The other word that the Lord gave me during this time was faithful, God's faithfulness. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. It says, For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? God's faithfulness says that he has, he is, and he will continue to help you and me. It means that he is who he says he is, and he'll do what he says he'll do. It means that while you and I wait, we can trust him to be at work in our lives while we're waiting on the answer. And in that process, we can be asking ourselves questions like, what do I need to learn? How can I stretch? How can I grow? And God's faithfulness means that while we wait, we can get stronger. We just have to watch our weight. Justin and the worship team are coming now to sing a song that speaks clearly to God's faithfulness in our lives while we wait. And I want to encourage you to listen with your heart and to make application in your life. <laughs> Cause I know you make a way And I don't always understand And I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will believe it Cause you make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise to shake prison walls And I will speak to my fear I will preach to my doubt You were faithful then You'll be faithful now Standing on the world, calling heaven down to earth. You will fight my enemies, and this will end in victory. And I will believe it. Yes, I will believe it. Cause you make mountains move, you make giants fall. Songs of praise to shake prison walls. I will speak to my feet. I 
together. Father, we thank you so much that you were faithful then, and God, you will be faithful now. You do make mountains to move and giants fall and prison walls to shake in our lives. And God, I thank you that our stuff in life is never too big for you. Father, I ask that you teach us to trust you more while we're waiting. Father, that we would stand on your word, that we'd keep our eyes and our hearts and our words focused on you. God, I thank you that you never fail and you never will. With your head still bowed and your eyes closed, the best decision that you can make in life is to invite Christ into your life and to enter into a life-giving, life-changing relationship with him. Perhaps you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus to come into your life. You've never said yes to him. Or perhaps you said yes in the past and for whatever reason you've gotten away from him. Today you can renew that relationship. If you've never said yes to Christ or you need to come back to him today, we're going to say a prayer in a minute. We're not going to call you out or embarrass you in any way. But if that's you today and you're saying, I want in on that prayer. I want to give God a chance in my life. I want to invite Christ into my life. If that's you, just right now, just simply raise your hand and say, Philip, include me in that prayer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Here's what we're going to do. We're all going to pray this prayer. We're going to pray it out loud. Say, Dear God, I know mankind needs a Savior. And I know I can't save myself. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And God raised you from the dead. Right now, I confess you as my Lord, as my Savior, as the one who forgives me and restores me. Thank you, Jesus. My past is forgiven. I have a relationship with you. I'm a new creation in Christ because I've said yes to you. Amen. Amen. Look up here and give me just one more minute. If you said yes today, Congratulations on that decision. We want to help you in that decision. There's a yes card for those of you here in the auditorium, the seat in front of you or beside you there. You can fill that out and you can turn it in one of the boxes as you leave. Those of you that are online and here on campus, you can text in to 313131. 
We'll get information to you that's going to be a help to you, and we're going to commit to praying with you for this next year. Guys, thank you for being here today. Remember, next Sunday, services at 9 and 1030, and we're going to have kids ministry at both. Thank you for being here. God bless you.